Greetings, everyone. Uh, this I am I am Douglas Preston, and my writing partner Lincoln Child. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, we want to welcome you all. Um, we're really excited. We're gonna we're gonna talk about our new book, and we have a whole bunch of questions here. We're gonna answer that that have been supplied to us, and uh, so so welcome. Um, Doug is so uh, Doug is in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm in Florida, and I've been looking. Hi, hello, Ellen from Sarasota. That's where I am. Um, and we've been watching the people scrolling across the screen, and it's amazing. Someone from England is here, um, so it's you know we just we just came off of a uh, a tour um, of several bookstores around the area, and we were just amazed by how far people had come to see us. I guess in the three years since we were shut down, and um, the excitement level of people finally getting out back again, and for us being able to shake the hands of um, our fans and, and hear their reactions, good or bad, was really, really enjoyable for us. Hello, Belfast. Uh, well, well, very good. And, and I, I second that. Um, so well, we thought we'd start by talking about how we got together as a writing team, because that's very unusual. They're most, most writers work alone, uh, without any uh, partner or anything like that. And I think that Lincoln and I have, have, are very unusual in, in that, that we've written how many, 30, 30 books together? Um, yeah, and counting. But, uh, well, it started back in the 1980s when I was working at the Museum of Natural History. And I got a call. Uh, I was working for the Museum of Natural History as an editor, and I was writing a little column in the magazine. And I got a phone call from an individual who identified himself as a senior editor at St. Martin's Press. And he wanted to meet me for lunch at the Russian Tea Room, which is one of the fanciest restaurants in New York City. So, and would I care to meet him for lunch? And I said, yes, I'd love to meet him for lunch. So I rushed out to the Salvation Army to buy a jacket so I could get into the Russian Tea Room. But when I arrived, I was looking for this distinguished gray haired, senior editor who I'd spoken to on the phone, but all I saw was a kid in the back of the restaurant waving at me. He was younger than I was. I was in my early 20s, and that was Lincoln Child. And he proposed that I write a book about the museum, a nonfiction book, and that became my first book called Dinosaurs in the Attic. And if you haven't uh, bought that book, I, I you must go out and buy it right away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, it's it's a nonfiction story about how the museum collected all those stupendous things, the Star of India, the Tyrannosaurus Rexes, everything else. And here's my little nano Tyrannosaur here um, for you to look at while we speak. So anyway. Yeah, Doug stole that on his last day at the museum. That was his parting gift. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I smuggled that out under my, uh, under my coat. Um, don't tell anyone, but. Anyway, so I, uh, so when the book was all done, Lincoln imposed upon me. He said, Doug, you know, you've described all these crazy areas in the museum that the public never sees. I want to see them. I want you to take me on a behind the scenes tour of the museum. And I said, Lincoln, I can't do that. I'm just a lowly employee. I don't have the security clearance. But Link kept bugging me and bugging me. And finally, I came up with a solution. But I give him a tour late at night when the museum was closed, when I wasn't going to run into anyone I knew. And I actually had a key. This was in the days when the museum security was lax. I had a key that would open a whole bunch of doors. It wasn't exactly a skeleton key, but if I shoved it into a lock, about 30% of the time, it would unlock it. Um, I don't know why they gave me that key. But anyway, so I gave Link a midnight tour of the museum. I think I'll turn it over to him to describe what happened on that tour. Uh, yeah, I'll be very brief, um, uh, or as brief as I, I can be by nature. And um, as Doug said, I was a huge fan of the museum, and that's why I, I reached out to him and tapped him to write the book, a behind the scenes tour of the museum. Because, you know, I was a, a, a member of the museum. I had taken 
what pass for behind the scenes tours. And if you've ever taken a, a tour like that, you'll see, you know, you'll see a few offices and stuff, and then you'll see a tarp or a curtain. And clearly what's beyond that is the most interesting stuff. You know, I could see Indiana Jones's pith helmet where uh, he hung, you know, he hung it when he was between um, looting, desecrating tombs. And so I insisted that Doug take me to a tour or I would, I wouldn't promote his book. No, I didn't, I didn't say that. Um, but uh, it took some real persuasion. So finally he took, got me in there and the things I saw, uh, no, he didn't run into Ben Stiller, but that would have been nice. Um, uh, the things I saw there were amazing. Um, I went to the, with Doug, to the Dermested Beetle Room. And this is the place where Dermested Beetles are these carnivorous beetles that eat flesh. And if you want to, you know, if you've got a giant sloth or a hippo or something, God forbid a hippo, to throw in and you throw it in there and the bugs would eat all the flesh off the bones and leave a nice clean skeleton um, for mounting. Um, and if you left it in too long, the skeleton would be eaten. So you had to watch it. Um, and then they took me to the uh, dinosaur bone storage room where it had to be in the basement because the weight of the bones was so heavy that if it was anywhere else, it would have collapsed the floor. And finally, it was, this was like a movie set. He, he took me up to the uh, fourth floor where the uh, Hall of Cretaceous Dinosaurs was located. And, you know, there was, by now, it, what was a threatening evening was now a, a full-blown thunderstorm outside. And we could see lightning flashing through the upper windows, you know, lighting the mandible of the T-Rex underneath us, I mean, you know, towering above us. Um, and I turned to Doug and I said, you know, Doug, I know you've been thinking about a mystery set in this museum. I don't think that would work. You know, mysteries don't sell very well unless you're hugely popular. But what about a Michael Crichton style techno thriller? Because this is before techno thrillers were common. Um, and we write it together and we set it in the museum. And Doug kind of looked at me and I could see the wheels turning in his head, you know, and just then a security guard walked in and I'll let Doug finish the story. Well, we were, you know, the hall was dark. They turned out all the lights uh, and they just had a strip of fluorescent lighting in the ceiling, which cast the most incredibly creepy shadows. And I remember Link saying, man, this is the scariest building. I mean, we got to write a thriller. So we started loudly talking about this thriller we were going to write, <clears throat> which became the relic, by the way. And all of a sudden, this voice rang out from the door. Who's there? Who's that in there? And it was a guard. And he had his flashlight. And he was scared to death. He'd heard our voices and he couldn't see us. Who's there? Show yourselves. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm in trouble now. I'm this lowly museum employee. Um, I'm, you know, I've got this straight, this person in here who's not auth authorized it's in the museum after hours. I'm surely going to be fired. But Link said, Doug, let me handle this. <laughs> so I said, please. So Link said, oh, thank God you found us. We've been wandering around this museum for hours. How do we get out of here? And the guard said, what? He said, it's... It's one o'clock in the morning. The museum closed at five. And Link said, don't we know it? Oh my God, we can't find our way out. We've been lost for hours. How do we get out of here? <laughs> the guard was totally taken in. He said, oh, he said, my gosh, I'm so sorry. Let me show you how, how to get out. So he, he led us out through the security entrance, never asked for my ID, never discovered I was a museum employee. Well, when that happened, I thought to myself, now this Lincoln child is going to be a good partner to have <laughs> in life because, uh, you know, he's uh, going to get keep me out of trouble because I'm unfortunately someone who gets in a lot of trouble. I very impulsive, as he'll tell you. But anyway, um, I thought, well, as far as partners go, I'm, I'm this this guy has proven himself, and I think this partnership has done very well. It's been 35 years. And based on just a handshake, not even a written document, 
We have published 30 books together. Uh, what? Almost all of them have been New York Times bestsellers, except for maybe two or three. Um, we've had an amazing run. And uh, this, I feel so fortunate to have met Lincoln and to have received and, that phone call. I think, well, what would my life be like if he hadn't called me, made that phone call? I don't know. So, and it's, it's readers like you and people who are interested in our fiction that have made this possible. And so we do, if you don't get a chance later, we want to thank you very much because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And we're going to take your questions in a minute because your questions are more interesting than anything we could think of to say. But um, I, before I do that, we would do that. I want to address quickly one of the other things we're frequently asked, and that is how do two people write together and where did Pendergast come from? Um, and I won't, I won't go into the whole story of how that writing dynamic has changed um, uh, over the years. It has changed. Um, now we're writing about 50-50, um, basically. But in the old days, I was an editor by trade, and so I would write outlines for the chapters and give them to Doug, generally. Um, and he would write a first draft, which I would then revise. And um, I would, you know, that would make him very upset. You know, my I dare to touch his, you know, Shakespearean prose. Um, and so he would often get sarcastic. Uh, and um, by the time we got to just the fourth chapter in the book, and, you know, we were writing this as a lark. We we really never, we hoped, we never knew we were going to get published. Um, he had written a chapter of the investigation of the first murder in the museum, and there were two New York City cops. And we both, you know, were living in New York, and, and we knew, you know, um, the ins and outs of the of the police department and everything else, and so Doug Doug wrote. Uh, I, it was either like a quintessential Italian New York cop and a quintessential Irish New York cop, or whatever it was. There were two of them, very similar. And I said to him, um, Doug, you know, I think that this, you know, we could do better than this. I think we can fold that those two cops into one character, one voice. And then add somebody different into the mix, you know, to give a different perspective on this on this crazy case, you know, maybe maybe somebody kind of eccentric, you know, who would look at those blood spatters and instead of, you know, going up, rushing up and measuring them, he comments on how it reminds him of a Jackson Pollock painting or something like that. And by this time, Doug was really upset, and he said, "What are you talking about? Like, like what? Like, like, like." an albino from New Orleans or something. Um, and uh, I thought for a minute and I said, um, yeah, yeah, I think we, we could work with that. You know, uh, <laughs> no, nothing That's, against albinos, please. Um, there's- Oh no, 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 um, it's-, uh, it's, it's he, But Doug, Doug was upset at the moment, you know, you know how it happens. And um, Pendergast is very, very pale, very blonde. And when we first wrote about him, we never thought he would turn into the character he is now. I mean, Doug, to his credit, wrote, rewrote that character. And maybe it was his anger or whatever, you know, um, mortification of what I'd said. He really made a unique character. And I really liked it and I built on it. And um, it was a success, except he didn't make it into the, the movie. They left him on the cutting room floor. Um, and then we basically abandoned him for several books until we got smart and realized he was the best um, character we'd ever invented. And so we brought him back in the Cabinet of Curiosities, which was really the book that that got us, jump-started our career again and, and got us started. And that is a book that if people ask us, what is our favorite book or what book should I read first? If you don't want to start at the beginning with Relic, a great book to start with is Cabinet of Curiosities, because that really introduces you to Pendergast and, and his backstory, which we didn't know about until he told us about it in that book. You know, he 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 tells us what to write. I mean, it's like you know, riding a horse he, and letting him have his head. Um, and you know, Pendergast in that book faced a lot of the most evil 
um, antagonists he's ever met until his most recent book and our new one, The Cabinet of Dr. Lang, where as Doug can tell you, he meets probably the most, we don't want to give any away any spoilers, but he meets somebody that for the first time he cannot deal with on his own. And I'll let Doug talk a bit more about that and then we'll open the floor to questions. And I just want to let you know that Doug, I'm, I'm trusting Doug because he's the one who sees all the questions to um, chaperone it so that he doesn't take all the good questions and leave me all the bad ones. So not that there are any bad ones, but you know what I mean. Go ahead, Doug. Well, I'm going to leave you all the challenging questions, but challenging. The, okay. the, the, the creation of Dr. Lang, Dr. Enoch Lang, um, you know, Pendergast is a very unusual and eccentric character. And we've really built on him and we put into him a lot of the characteristics that we wish we had, but we don't. You know, the sophistication, the intelligence, the strength, the good the looks, money, you know, <laughs> the money, you know. But um, we needed to create a character, an antagonist who was equal to him. And that was Dr. Enoch Lang. Um, and he is truly uh, the most depraved uh, and terrifying character I think we've, we've created in our 21 Pendergast books. And we introduced him in the Cabinet of Curiosities, but in the Cabinet of Dr. Lang is where we really meet him for the first time in all his sick and horrifying glory. Um, he's not a simple character at all. He's very complex, but very unusual. I, we, as, as Link said, we really can't say much more than that because it's a thriller and we don't want to give anything away. And also he's a character that has to be read, uh, not described, because um, he's so uh, unusual, I guess I should say. And Doug, so I, just want to, I just want to interrupt briefly because somebody, I, I, forgive me if I, mis, if I mispronounce your name, but Lyane, Lyane just said that they're glad that Pendergast was not in the movie because that way they could keep him in their imagination. Uh, and that's a really, Leanne, okay, thank you. Um, and that's a really interesting thought. We've never heard that before. You know, the question we're always asked is, who should play Pendergast? And over the years, it's been a long time. You know, it's it's gone from Rudolph Valentino to, you know, Laurence Olivier to um, Christopher Walken, Matthew McConaughey, Benedict Cumberbatch. But um, the fact that he wasn't in the film at all, although that that makes it difficult for us now because we'd love to see a, a, a TV streaming series with him in it. And that's out of the question temporarily. That's a very interesting observation. Sorry, Doug, well, go ahead. I'm, I'm gonna say something about that, uh, add to that. Um, the, um, you know, they cut him out of the movie, uh, even, even though they promised us that he was gonna be a main character in the film. But the reason they cut him out was they couldn't deal with him. He's too complicated. This is what they told us. He was too complicated in the movie, he took over every scene. And so they just cut him out. And the character of D. Augusta was much more of a Hollywood character. Well, that was you know a little disappointing to us. But since then, they Paramount Pictures, which made the movie, has owned the character rights for film and television for that character. And they've done nothing with him at all. And we, our agent spoke to them a, a few years ago and said, you know, are you ever gonna do anything with Pendergast? And he said, no, we have no interest in ever doing anything with that character. And so on the basis of that, we went out and we got a huge amount of interest from Netflix, from Warner, the streaming services, Hulu, all wanted to do a series a television series based on Pendergast and the Cabinet of Curiosities. And we were we had a very nice offer over a million dollars from Warner to do it. And others made offers too. And then Paramount sent a letter to our agent saying, no, um, you're not gonna do anything with that character. We own that character. And even though 
they have said repeatedly, they're never gonna do anything with that character. They will not release that character. They are keeping their, their foot, uh, their boot on his neck. And we're very upset by that. And so we're thinking of starting a movement, free Pendergast hashtag or something. Yeah. He's, he's playing his, his little violin. He doesn't like me complaining about this. And we don't like to complain either, but it's really, I mean, Pendergast is one of our, is our life's creation, we think. And to have this Paramount Studios sitting on this character for 27 years, telling us they're never gonna do anything with him, nor are they ever gonna let him go, is upsetting to us. Hashtag so free Pendergast. Free Very Pendergast, good. anyway. Um, but anyway, we're we're still trying to work it out with him. Uh, hope hopefully we will, but uh, it doesn't look good because you should have seen that really nasty legal letter they sent. Oh my God! Anyway, okay, simmer down now. Okay, it's it's okay. It's all right. So uh, anyway, I think we probably complained long enough or talked talked long enough. It may be time for some questions, and I have some questions over here on my other computer screen. And, uh, and so they're really good questions. These are questions that people sent in earlier. Um, and uh, I've gone through them and picked out the really uh, hard questions for Lincoln to answer and the easy <laughs> ones for me to answer. Um, but listen, all right, here's, here's, one of the, here's a question for Lincoln. What have been the advantages of collaborating in your writing career? How did that affect your growth and how you came to be how did you come to be the writers that you are now? That's a question from Beth Higby. So Beth, uh, if you're there, Lincoln's gonna answer your question. What are the advantages of collaborating? Okay, thank you, Beth. Um, I, I'll simplify your question, if I may, um, to what are the benefits of collaborating? Because if I was to tell you what it was like to become change from an editor to a writer, you know, I'd be, I, um, I'd be here for a long time. But a lot of people, uh, including publishers, back when we started, didn't think two people could write a novel together. You know, nonfiction, history of World War II or whatever, sure. But who can write, how can somebody write a novel with somebody else? You know, and they were afraid that Doug would write chapter one, I'd write chapter two, and you know, it would be, become a mess and people would notice the difference in writing. So we really had a tough time up, up front. Um, and in fact, uh, in, in some foreign countries, they called us Lincoln Preston because they were afraid people wouldn't uh, buy the books if they saw, you know, but the fact is Doug and I passed the chapters back and forth so much and we put a, a Zamboni over the thing at the end so that you can't really tell hopefully who's writing what. Um, and this became, even clearer to us when we branched out into writing solo novels, because each of us have written several solo novels. And it was only then that we realized how helpful it is to have a co-author, somebody we can trust and somebody who we, whose judgment we respect, because I don't think a lot of people stop to think about it, but writing commercial fiction is a lonely job. And is also a rather, a, terrifying job because you were faced every day with forks in the road. You know, what direction should the next chapter take? Is this the right fork or is it the wrong fork? And when I'm writing a book with Doug, I know he's got my back. I know he's looking over my shoulder. I know he'll complain if I do something that's too long or too short and vice versa. I can rein him in when I have to. And if we're stuck, we can talk to each other. And of course, the downside is that we each take credit for the good parts um, and we have to split the dough. But, um, you know, I think um, much as I like my own books and Doug likes his own books, um, uh, I think we're better together as a sum of, than the some of our parts. It's kind of like, like Steely Dan, you know, the Walter and uh, um, Donald, you know, were so great together. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. All right, now there's another question here for Lincoln, um, which is really, we've never been asked this question before and I'm curious oh, to hear geez. the answer. It's from Kevin McGuire. Who would have been asked to lunch if Doug 
hadn't accepted. I want to find out who this, this scumbag might have been. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I, I wish we could give you a prize for that because we've never been asked that question before. And we've been asked a lot of questions. Um, the way I found Doug was um, by reading through their magazine and finding the person who wrote most of the, the history of the museum, as opposed to articles about underwater photography or about this or that species of paramecium, you know. Um, he Doug wrote about like Peary and finding fossils and about this and that scandal. Um, uh, and so Doug was the one who wrote most of those articles. And so I, I called the museum and I reached out and I got a hold of him. He wasn't hard to get a hold of because he was kind of low in the totem pole at the time. I mean, yeah, it was a guy... big totem pole, don't get me wrong. Anyway, had Doug said no, um, I would probably have asked him uh, who else to talk, who else could would do it then? Because I had no idea if he was 70 and about to retire or if he was young or if he would be would be afraid to reveal some of these things because there's some things in the book the museum wasn't too pleased to have talked about and you know Doug um, was was raring to go and it was time for him to write a book but you know what the final answer is I might have written it myself because that was my first idea but I was taking those tours behind the scenes I thought when I retire, I'm going to write a book about this place. It's so amazing. And then I, of course, had an epiphany. Why should I write it when I can get some other poor sap to write it? I'm an editor. I can find somebody else. So I hope that answers your question, Kevin. And um, here's a virtual pen we're giving you, virtual, you understand, for asking that question. Well, thank you, Lincoln. That, that, that's an interesting answer. I'm certainly glad you didn't write that book yourself because then you'd be partnering with yourself. And where would and, I be? Oh, and also if I'd written it, it would have been one tenth as good. So um, I'm glad okay. I, I didn't write it too. All right, well, here's, here's a question from Laura Brengelman. How, I like this question because of the, the way it's phrased. How do you research and confirm the superbly minute and always well-placed details that bring your books to such vivid life. You can, this, I, Laura, I commend you on your literary taste. Oh, Doug, can for you example, repeat that again? That's <laughs> probably what? That's for example, the possibility of small albino eels in the shallow water in the underground passageway, the visceral smells of 1880 New York, details of common folks' clothing, nuances of speech. So, how do we do that? Um, pure, Heartbreaking genius. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know what? We love researching. I mean, both Lincoln and I are information junkies. I mean, we just, I mean, I don't know. My brain is so full of completely useless information. I mean, when I was going to college, I was taking advanced calculus. And then I took physics. And then I took astrophysics. And then I took, you know, chemistry. And I, and at a certain point, I thought, what in the world? Am I ever going to use this useless knowledge for? This and I didn't even know they taught those courses at vocational colleges, you know. <laughs> but uh... yeah, at the at the <laughs> Titicaca Community Get Tech School. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway. So, but it turns out that uh, both of us have sticky brains, and I retain all this stuff. And all of a sudden, we're writing a novel, and all of a sudden, I need to. We need to portray. A brilliant engineer is a character, a genius, a polymath. And all of a sudden, all that stuff that I learned that's rattling around there becomes relevant. And then what I don't know, I know how to find. And this is, you know, before the days of, of Googling, research was complicated to do. You had to go to the library and stuff. So both Lincoln and I are really good researchers and we do our own research. We would never, never hired ever anyone to do research for us because part of the joy is when you're researching something, it's what you're not looking for that, and that you find when you're not looking for, it's a Zen thing, whatever you're not looking for, 
you find it. It's the most beautiful thing. And that goes in the novel. Um, I'd like to add a few words to that, Doug, if I might. Um, um, we also only write about things that fascinate us. You know, sometimes it's subjects we already know about. Sometimes it's not. And that gives us a chance to research them ourselves, like in archaeology and Thunderhead, and pass it on to our readers. Or, you know, there are a lot of cases where Doug knows about science. I can pass that on to him or, you know, me and, and whatever arcane interests I have. But to, to, um, to allude to your particular example that you gave in your question, um, in the title pools, you know, in that case, um, I wrote the initial chapters of the latest book in which take place in the 1880s New York. And I had to sit there and think about what would be the initial things that a reader from today would notice. Because, you know, um, we, we, we only write what interests us, what we think readers would, would, would enjoy if, if, you know, if they have similar interests to us. And so I thought about it and I, I thought the first thing that would hit me is the smell. And the second thing that would hit me is the fact of sunlight because all the buildings are so low in Manhattan back then. And, you know, even though I've been an editor and I'd, I'd, I'd read too many historical novels where the person had read, read 10 histories and said, okay, now I'm gonna, I've done all this research, I'm gonna cram all this into the book and make sure all you readers get it too. We, you know, we, we don't do that. We just add enough to, to, to hopefully get those little filigrees you mentioned. And then Doug would take it and he'd add exactly what you mentioned in the puddles because he would see spots where he could add his own touches that I knew nothing about and his own nuances. Or in the other case, if Doug wrote the chapter, you know, I would add things to it. And so that's that's really a great example of how the two of us can, can add more detail um, while trying to write books that fascinate the two of us. Well, that, that's that's right. And all right, now the next question comes from Linda Shakespeare, and I'm going to answer it because this is going to allow me to trump Lincoln. Um, oh, God. <laughs> Linda Shakespeare has asked, tell us about your educational experiences, your education experiences. Well, I happen to be, I happen to have a doctor of letters degree, honoris causa. And I have been that trying, again. What are those last two words? Honoris causa. And I've Faith, been trying, what it means. ever since I received this doctorate, I have been trying to get Lincoln to, ref to speak to me properly as Dr. Preston. <laughs> and all I get is, is abuse and four letter words. Um, Lincoln, on the other hand, barely has a BA. I mean, he just scraped by. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm just, just saying, just saying, I just wanted to mention that. All right. Now it's an honorary, an honorary degree, and I always say that I think Doug and I both should have gotten 30 PhDs in creative writing by now because we've written 30 novels, you know, but only Doug got the honorary degree. I, Unlike him, I didn't endow a, 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 you know, a swimming pool to, to a, my college. <laughs> yeah, so, and I, Just joking. I received that that honorary degree from Pomona College in Claremont, California, a most excellent school. Much better than Stanford, by the way. All right, next question. When introducing a new character to a novel, regardless of how long their appearance may be, how do you decide what their personality will be like? Is it strategic to the plot to make them mean or pleasant, for example? Or does it come to you naturally as you write? Maybe a little bit of both. Thanks. And that's from Jim Winepress. Um, you know, I'm, I'll answer that partly and then I'll let Lincoln add to it because that's a really good question because the characters that we come up with, some are mostly from Lincoln and others are mostly from me. And creating a real human being, we're sort of like God, you know, you're you're creating a person, and some of our characters are more real to us than even some of the allegedly real people we know. Um, so, like we told you about how we <laughs> came up with Pendergast, but now let's let's talk about Corey Swanson for a second. 
that was a character that I mostly came up with. At the time, that was the, she was introduced in Still Life with Crows, which I think is one of our best books. I think it actually is our, in some ways, our most horrifying books. Books. My wife read that book and said, "Doug, I hated that book. That's the most awful book. It's so awful. I hope you never write another book like that." And I took that as great praise. She meant so awful that was frightening and disgrace and terrifying and and sick and perverse. I mean, anyway, we won't go into that. But anyway, so I created this character of Corey, mostly myself, a 17 or 17 year old um, a high school girl who helps Pendergast. She's kind of a goth. And uh, that I was really concerned that being a, at the time a 40 year old man that I wouldn't know, you know, I wouldn't be able to get into the head of a, of a rebellious, 17 year old girl with an alcoholic mother, the father's left, lived growing up in a small town called Medicine Creek, Kansas, being bullied all her life. I mean, you know, I, I was really worried I wouldn't be able to get into her head, but it just so happened that I had an 18 year old daughter and I said, and she was great. I said, what, what can you help me with this character? And she cut a playlist for me to listen to or the music that Corey listened to. She, she, she told me exactly what kind of clothes she'd wear, what her thoughts would be, how she would deal with the bullying. She's very, a reader, you know, she would escape through reading. So all this stuff, my daughter, Celine, was able to help me understand her. And I really got into her head. And I think she's one of our best characters, although some of our readers don't like her at all because she's sort of, uh, sort of a wise ass. But She's now a young FBI agent, and she's the star uh, with Nora Kelly of a new series of books we're writing, um, the Nora Kelly, Corey Swanson series. Anyway, so that's how I created her. But now, Lincoln, let me turn it over to you to talk about one of the characters that you largely created. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, and thanks for the question, um, Jim. <laughs> I liked your, your um, criticizing your own question, by the way. Um, uh, it's interesting watching these comments go scrolling up because usually we don't see that. And thank you all for not insulting us or our books or how we look. We can't help how we look. Um, but anyway, the, the character that I, 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 I'm particularly pleased with these days is uh, Constance Green. Um, and she's mostly my creation. Of course, she's Doug's as well. Um, how she came into being is too complicated to get into, although we love telling the story. Um, but as she came into her maturity, you know, for reasons, again, more complicated than I can explain, um, she was very, she had a damaged personality. Uh, yes, gangsta, definitely. Um, and through no fault of her own, um, she has, uh, a very dysfunctional relationship with everybody in the, in the world. And I, I pictured this person who was attractive, of course, because, you know, I always think in movie terms, young, erudite, but with the brain of a 150-year-old person, totally fearless, uh, with flapperish bob uh, cut hair, and with the, um, the sociopathic uh, values of the woman in the girl with the dragon tattoo. Um, and, you know, and who loves Cop Pendergast and would help him wherever. And so, you know, I'm so pleased I've engineered the last couple of books so that um, she's front and center in those. Um, well, I, I have a, there's a, hold on, I'm just going to interrupt you for a second because there's another question in this list that relates to her directly that I'm going to ask you. This is from Jennifer Snively. Do you consider Constance Green sane? <laughs> uh, do you consider Hannibal Lecter sane? Um, I don't think anybody knows what kind of insanity he is. It's not in the DSM-5. You couldn't find it there. Um, I think she is, I think her mind is in an area where no psychiatrist has ever been or plumbed. And um, I think 
Let's just say that she's as sane as she could possibly be, be under the circumstances. Sane but disturbed, yes. Um, right. Sane but very disturbed. <laughs> With plenty of demons that will never be exercised, no matter what. Well, she's very complicated. I, I don't know if I'd, if I'd call her insane. She's sane, but uh, with an asterisk. Um, sane with benefits. How about that? She's sane with benefits. You, you know, and I also have to say that Lincoln has the hots for her. So talk about benefits. I didn't say anything. <laughs> okay. That was all, all right. I'm done. Now we have a, a question from Gina. Kozlowski, um, who was a middle school teacher, which, which we love you, we love teachers. Um, and we think you are the teachers and librarians are the two people who have changed our lives. And uh, so God bless you. All right, Tina Kozlowski, her, her question is, um, I was wondering how early did your interest in an enjoyment of writing develop? And I'll answer that question uh, first, and then if Link wants to add, add to it. Um, well, I, I remember, I have a very clear memory of my mother at four years old teaching me how to write, a uh, read. Uh, she, um, I came from a family where the, the idea was that your parents teach you how to read uh, before you go to school. So before I went to kindergarten, my mother, taught me how to read. And I remember laboring over the words and how difficult they were and thinking to myself, I'm never going to get this and complaining and saying, can we stop now? No, we'll just read one more sentence. Oh, no, not one more sentence. But I was really anxious to learn how to read because my older brother knew how to read and I wanted to keep up with him. And I became an avid reader after that. I mean, I just devoured the books. Now, I wasn't reading, you know, Dostoevsky, I was reading the Hardy Boys and things like that. And then graduating to like H. Ryder Haggard and those advent boys adventure stories, but really good books. Um, and, you know, so the reading, you know, started first, and then the writing, I remember, when I was around 10 or 11, I started, I, a friend of mine, P.D. Anderson, and I just, we decided to write a novel called Animal Valley. And it was a novel about all these animals that lived in a valley and they all talked like people and they had adventures. And uh, that novel is lost. Um, all the pages are gone. Uh, but we got to about 200 pages and Petey's mother, uh, Mrs. Anderson, uh, typed up all our scribblings and we actually had a manuscript that was two or 300 pages, but it's gone. What a loss to scholarship. That's terrible. Speed up a bit. <laughs> I got to say a few words about myself. Yes, please, Lincoln. Um, uh, in, 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 in much briefer uh, terms, I uh, loved to read and write even before I was able to write. Um, my dad was a professor and he'd bring home college blue books for exams. And I would just scribble in the pages before he knew how to do it. Um, and my first book was called Bumble, Bumble the Elephant. Um, funny, we both read about animals. And that too was lost to scholarship. Um, you know, it's a, a terrible shame. I then went and wrote a shamelessly Tolkien-esque novel in high school. Um, college, I was an English major. That, that turned me off from writing all the analysis and everything. And then being in publishing where the, the editors are so cynical and everybody thinks, that they can, um, no, I don't have my parrot anymore, I'm sorry. Um, um, you know, everybody has a book under the, under the bed, every editor. And so it took getting together with Doug to reawaken my nascent interest in writing. Um, and I hope that uh, <laughs> somebody just said that we, we write about animals a whole lot, and yet somehow we managed to kill a whole bunch of them off in our books. Um, well, Doug, maybe you better answer that. <laughs> you mean about the people we kill in our books? No, we, we create, as kids, we created a lot of animals in our oh, yeah. stories. But now it seems like we're so busy, you know, 
taking yep. you know doing things with horses dogs um, i know well it's you know lincoln that's all lincoln's fault um no 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 what happened was in our, our book uh it was thunderhead we had a dog named thurber who disappears and is presumed dead now in that book um you know many people are killed but we got a thousand emails from people saying how could you kill that poor dog? You, you bad, bad people. You write, I'm never going to read a book again. We were like, well, didn't you notice that we also killed 30 people in that book and decapitated them and rip, you know, they had their brains eaten. But so both Lincoln and I, let me just say that we are both dog lovers and we both own dogs. And, uh, but so, so Lincoln was a little irritated by this. So, so a few books later, we were kind of stuck. We said, well, what should happen now? No, this is not, so, this is a lie. Okay. No, and, so you and, know. Um, and Lincoln said, I think we better, I think we should kill a dog. <laughs> that was, no, you did. It was in uh, uh, Crooked River. And I, you said, I think that the, that the chief of police has to kill his own dog because the dog is running away with a human foot in its mouth that is evidence in a murder. And he's going toward the, to the swamp where that foot might be lost. It's sacred human remains and he has to shoot his dog in order to stop him from running off with a foot. I mean, that is sick. I mean, who could have written that? Who are these people that okay. would write something like that? Okay. Now, just let me... Uh... I mean, let me amend that slightly. Um, I certainly didn't suggest the dog be killed, but I may well have said, if we have to do it, have the sheriff do it and have a reason to do it and have it be his own dog. So at least people will understand. But, you know, Doug, in our last book, we were, we were casting about for what to do. And I said, what, what? And he said, we haven't killed a dog in a while. Don't you remember that? And we didn't kill any any dogs um, at all or any other animals. But it seemed to bother people so much that I almost had us put in in the acknowledgments of the book. No animals were harmed in the writing of this book because people took it so seriously. So just for the record, we love dogs. Dogs, I have got a Dalmatian that uh, I, I love dearly. Doug's had several dogs. Uh, he had many horses, and, and we love animals. I've had parrots, um, gerbils, rats, hamsters, fish. You know, thank you. We believe Deuce. you. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, no, but I have to say that on the little chat that's going on here, okay, there's someone who suggested maybe we should start killing cats. And then someone else was saying, no, no, not the cats. And so I'm, I'm afraid that, that we've really freaked people out thinking that we're gonna start killing cats. Lincoln, is it time to kill a cat? <laughs> what do you think? Tell us in your chats. <laughs> Somebody suggested we kill a budgie, you know, a, uh, <laughs> a parakeet. We're, lemmings. we're gonna kill lemmings. <laughs> Well, I I don't know. I don't think we we better. But I like. I think we're there, they're about to uh, make have us wrap this up. But I did want to say one thing similar to that thing. Some people say to us, "This is similar a similar complaint." They say, "You guys use the f bombs, you know, here and there, and you know, I'm never reading another one of your books." And I have two things to say about that. First, have you been to a, a Hollywood film recently? You know, and, you know, it's like you're assaulted by it. And secondly, we don't use the F-bomb. It's our characters who do. And, you know, certain characters speak that way. And it would be unrealistic if we left it out. Um, and so we, we don't really, we don't recommend our book for children ever, you know, but... Um, uh, well, here we are, yeah, here we are. We're talking about killing cats and dogs and the F-bomb. I think we're being given the hook. By it's who? Time to wrap this up. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. No, I'm kidding. We're not being given the hook. But unfortunately, the hour is coming to an end. Um, I wish we could have seen you in person. This is a very lively group. 
Uh, we love your questions. There's so many great questions. They're like 10 times more questions than we could possibly answer. So yeah, come and see us in Savannah, Georgia. We're giving the keynote address for the, the uh, Savannah Book Festival. But before we stop, I just want to thank Barnes & Noble for doing this. This is a fantastic bookstore chain. Um, we love them. They are keeping books alive. And if you go to their to their website, you might be able to find some signed books of ours that they're still available. Um, or if you just go in any Barnes and Noble, they're selling our book at a very good discount. But uh, anyway. Um, It'll take eight to 10 days to mail it, um, uh, business days, but um, uh, they, they've done a fantastic job for us and so have you. And you know, I, if, I apologize if I got us off in the weeds talking about animals and, and uh, the F-bomb, but because there are so many great questions we would like to have answered. And Proctor, you know, somebody mentioned him. He's he's going to keep playing a big, big roles, you know, but we'll do, we promise if Barnes & Noble invites us, we'll do this again for our next book in August. And we, we'd be delighted to answer more of your questions. I'm just sorry we couldn't answer more now. Thank you so much for your interest and for your, your reading our books and um, take care and be well. Yes, thank you very much. We love you. We love our readers. <laughs>